Hello, hello, welcome back to the studio. Today we're gonna talk about materials. This is something I have not put a full video out on and it's something that I've made multiple videos of and just never posted them. So I wanted to go back and start again on this topic. Tools can really be subjective to every single artist. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Tools can be so unique to each artist and every single person is gonna have a different use for them. But these are the tools that I use for my collage practice and I hope it helps you decide what you wanna use for your practice. Over the past month, I've worked on making my Amazon storefronts, so I have those linked below if you want to check out any of these products, but I'm going to talk through them now as well. If you're looking to up your game as a collage artist, there are so many different tools that you're going to need. As a collage artist, you can really use any tools around the house like kitchen scissors or any old glue, but if you want to elevate your practice to a professional level, these are the tools that you're going to need. These materials will ensure that your work will last for a lifetime. Similar to how an acrylic painter needs to jezzo their canvas to ensure it lasts a lifetime, we too in our practice need to figure out how to make our pieces last as long as possible. So let's start with the base materials. This is the thing that we are going to glue our piece onto. There are so many different options when it comes to collage, and I know on this channel I've showed a lot of different ways that I do it personally. From wood boards to papers, there are so many ways that you can finish your pieces. I think that this is something that's a little bit subjective. I use wood with pieces that I find have like a more masculine feel or to make a statement. Uh, there's so many different reasons why you could use wood. When I first was finishing my pieces on wood, like something like this, it has a beautiful resin finish, but the underpiece is just a wood board panel. I use this a lot for pieces, as I said, that were more masculine. So this one I just felt was more masculine. And so I did this as a finish and I really like the finish. So this is something that you guys could definitely do. When creating the piece, you need to think about what it's trying to say. And maybe there's a better background for that. For the base, I used to use multimedia paper. I found that it had a nice texture that would help the glue stick. More recently, I switched to a thicker cardstock for some. I don't really actually have one that I actually stick to. I kind of go all over the place, but yeah, so uh, cardstock is definitely one of them. And one time, because my artwork is vintage, I wanted to have a vintage feel. So I found like a more creamy paper uh, that just made the pieces feel a little bit warmer, which is where I was going with the pieces. Since my work isn't supposed to be extremely contemporary, this really works for those pieces. The one thing that you do need to make sure of with your base layer though is that it's acid free. We're going to talk about this a lot in the video, but acid free papers are going to ensure that your papers don't yellow over time. So what does acid free mean? Acid free paper is paper that if infused with water yields a neutral or basic pH level. This is seven or slightly greater. Acid free paper is said to last over a thousand years versus paper with acid that can deteriorate a lot faster. I don't know that much about this, but definitely go look into it if you're interested in knowing the technical terms of the acid-free versus acid paper. Some of my earlier pieces, I was using papers and I didn't check this, and a lot of them have yellow spots, especially where the glue is. It's like if you use a, a glue that isn't acid-free, we're gonna get into that, and then if you use paper that isn't acid-free, that's a double whammy, and you're gonna see a lot of yellowing over time. I'll show this big boy off too, but this is a watercolor paper by Canson. This is the one that I've previously used in the past for my larger artworks that are framed. I find it to have a very lovely light texture, so when I'm working with papers that, you know, are a little bit more smooth and can handle a little bit of bump, I really like to work with this as I find it gives a texture for the full piece versus a modern finish. My art obviously runs to the vintage side, but if your work is more contemporary, you might want to think about the papers that you're using. If you're using something with cardstock with no grit, it's going to look a lot more modern than something with paper textures and those types of things. The next thing to talk about is the papers themselves. What are you making on top of your base layer? So for me, I generally use vintage magazines, as you guys know, but for other people, they use books, catalogs, old photographs. Some people print off their own images. Some people use construction paper. This is definitely the part that's subjective. It just depends on what you want to use. If you're interested in how I source my magazines, I'm going to put a card somewhere here where you can go click and look at that video. If you're just starting out, there's a lot of books like the Extraordinary Things to Cut Out book. Um, I have that linked as well in my Amazon storefront. I find that book very useful if you're looking for a specific thing and you know that it's in there, it's a great place to start. Now that you have your papers, what are you gonna cut them with? There are so many tools when it comes to cutting in collage. Some people even just rip the papers to make an interesting texture. But for me, you guys know which ones I really like if you've watched any of my videos. 
I love my Westcott Titanium Non-Stick Scissors. These are amazing. I looked high and low for this exact pair again after my last pair kind of started breaking down. Not sure how to show them. I'll do it like the influencer makeup people do, but these are an amazing pair of scissors. I feel like they're the perfect size for me. The next thing I have is just a little pair of embroidery scissors. These are great for getting into small spaces. I definitely find having smaller ones very useful, but I always end up using these ones when I should be using these ones. I definitely think you should be training on at least two different pairs of scissors in two different sizes if you're trying to get really good at cutting. The next tool is a scalpel or craft knife. This is great for getting into small crevices around arms, for example, if they're holding their hip. I find this better when it comes to straight lines or larger curves. When I need to get around something that's bumpy, for example, I just did those tentacles, I find scissors way easier in that regard. This is also great paired with a ruler. If you wanna cut a page perfectly off or do larger lines with a ruler, for example, very, very helpful. When choosing a ruler, I highly recommend you get a metal one with some sort of cork on the bottom, that way it has some sort of grip, and that way the knife is not gonna cut through it or have any imperfections. The next tool is this. I'm not actually sure what these are called, but I call them paper cutter tool. Um, this is an amazing tool. It is great for doing straight lines again. It's similar to a craft knife and ruler, except for this one you can do any size, very small. I find it a little bit faster as well. And as I recently learned, it has a pop-out ruler actually. So if you wanna do like a specific size, like if you want an eight by eight print, for example, you can cut it at the eight mark and that will give you exact measurements. I always like to use this tool for cutting out squares, for example, within pages. I just find it a lot faster. The downfall of this though is that it's only so big. There is a larger size than this. If you're cutting cardstock or thick paper, this is not your tool. That's when you use the craft knife and ruler. This is great for thin paper, so I love it for my vintage magazines. And then we just have like the fun cutting tools. These are two that I really like. The first one is a circle cutter and you can adjust it up till 12 inches and it will cut a perfect circle for you. It has a knob here and you can adjust to the size you want. It has backup mini knives in here and so every once in a while you'll replace them. And basically if I'm the paper, you hold it here and then just turn it around, you hold down on it and then you have a perfect circle cut out of your magazine paper or whatever you're cutting out for collage. And if you're a little afraid of that one, this one is your friend then. This is a one inch circle paper cutter. So it basically has this bottom part where it will collect all the circles you do and then you just push down really hard on the paper like that and then you have circles done. I've used this for many amazing projects. You've maybe seen my video where I did DIY birthday cards. I know there's tons of different sizes. I think the larger sizes have less good reviews because you have to push down really hard. So I wouldn't go bigger than like maybe three inches with this. And then this one starts at four inches. So that gives you the full range of motion. And the last thing for cutting is you do not want to be destroying your desktop. So make sure to get yourself a cutting mat. My mat is massive and I absolutely love it. It's 24 by 36 inches, I believe, and I wouldn't go back to anything smaller. It helps me to be able to lay out everything out and cut it wherever I need to. I find it very useful having a large one. I used to have just a little tiny one. I do use this when I'm traveling. It's obviously easier to pack than this one, but I just find that having the two sizes has been well more than enough for me. The large one has really helped me when I'm working large scale. If you've seen my video where I make a six foot collage, I would not have been able to do this without the mat. Now, all of our papers are cut out. How are we attaching them all together to our base layer? Often when I have a complex piece, I actually start with scotch tape. This is the gloss finish transparent tape. It's the super see-through one. I'm pretty sure this is usually used for gift wrapping, but I find this perfect for the back of it so that if a small little piece is already cut out, you don't see it come through. This is the super thin one. I love this one. I think it's great, but the larger one would be better if your work is larger. We're now back to talking about acid-free options. This is the UHU glue stick. I like having a small one for smaller pieces and a larger one for larger pieces. These are made in Germany and they're acid-free. As I said before, my earlier pieces actually have lines through the back. You could see exactly where I put the glue because it yellowed over time. We do not want that to happen. So these are what is going to block that from happening. They are acid free and high quality. Although you can use a craft glue, it will ruin the pieces over time. My works from three years ago have already yellowed. So it's 100% certain that you're going to want these glue sticks. If you're going to use a different brand, just make sure it's acid free. And last but not least is matte medium. I love the golden brand. It's way more expensive than the other ones, but the quality is just so much better. This can be used for so many different things in your art practice. Whether it's photo transfers, sealing the piece itself, 
or gluing pieces to each other. I will say though, do not use this generously on vintage papers or any book papers that are thinner or uh, newspapers or anything like that. This is definitely going to make it wrinkle. So how I get that out is using just a teeny tiny brush and put a very, very small amount on. This is a speedball roller. This is generally for printmaking, but I've used it for getting bubbles out of papers. I start with one corner of the paper and slowly roll it on with this. This ensures no bubbles will be on the paper. Usually some of the glue comes out and then I'll just rub it off with a rag. When working large scale, I've really enjoyed using a spray adhesive. I think that this is the only way to do it for a larger size. I have heard of people using wallpaper glue. Um, I haven't tried that myself, so I can't vouch for it, but I do think that that's a cool idea. Now let's talk storage. There are so many ways that you can store papers and I've made an entire video on this, so I highly recommend you go watch that after this. These are two of my favorite organization methods is a binder where I put all of my people images and this, a puzzle organizer, which is such a strange thing to use, but it's amazing. I've been able to layer everything. So I start with large papers at the bottom and smaller pieces at the top. And then we could get into some of the other things like the foundation of my studio. Having an extremely large desk has been extremely helpful for making. As you know when you're collaging, you need as much surface area as possible. If you're currently designing your studio, do not choose the tiniest desk. Pick the biggest desk possible. This has been my perfect studio for a small space that I've created, and I highly recommend you go check out the video that talks about how I created it. The base of it is actually kitchen cabinets, and the top is kitchen counter. And that gave me way more durability and way more storage space. Highly recommend go checking that out. Now you have your piece done. You had your base, you've glued your papers, and you've attached it all together. What are we doing next? We're heading to the scanner. I actually got mine from the side of the road. It said free printer on it, I took it home. I tried to use the printer, the printer was broken, but the scanner really worked, so I kept it. The scanner is 13 by 19, which is crazy big, and I definitely recommend you getting one as big as you can. Scanners now are way more expensive, which I really don't understand. This one's on like a $200 printer, but it's massive. They don't exist like that anymore and buying a scanner separately can be extremely expensive. So I would highly recommend looking for something used, an old printer for example. Mine's a brother and I really love it. One day I'll get a new printer and I'll be able to do a video on it a little bit more about how I did my research. When creating my art prints, I scan them all on my scanner, then bring them into Photoshop, cut out all the pieces, recreate the piece, bring it into a template that I've made for the different sizes, get it printed by my printer, and then they go on my website. If you're new here, you should definitely go check out my website. It's flanzella.com. I sell art prints, totes, cards, all sorts of stuff. I sell a whole bunch of different things with my collages on them, so you should definitely go take a look. Now let's talk about finishing an artwork. So your piece is completely made, you've scanned it. What are we doing next? We have to finish the piece still. I love using the workable fixative. I think that this is the best thing you can do for your collages. Because it's not super thick and it's just a spray on, I find that the papers don't wrinkle from this. This is what it says on it. It protects computer prints, pencil, pastel, and chalk drawings, prevents smudging and wrinkles. Again, it says on the can that it's acid-free and it's a good thing to use for something like pastels to protect the work so that they don't smudge. But for us, it also provides a UV protection on works. If you're working with magazines, the printing was not meant to last a long time, right? This is a one-use consumption. So you need to protect it from the sun and make sure that if it's hanging in your house, it has either UV glass, something like this, or that it's not near direct light at all. You can also just use a matte medium on top of it, but sometimes the paper will wrinkle, so just use a very small amount. The alternative to that is using a matte varnish. Windsor & Newton is a great brand, it's professional, so highly recommend this one. If you've seen my other videos, you know that I love using resin on wood. I find that this is a great way to seal in your pieces. I use crystal resin, which starts with a K, crystal resin. Um, it's great, and I think that that is the one that a lot of artists have said is the best one because it doesn't yellow over time. I've only done this for the last year and a bit, so I can't vouch for it lasting a lifetime. It is liquid plastic though, and plastic lasts a lifetime, so maybe um, I will definitely keep you updated on that. I think that this is a great option. It looks glossy and high-end, and it definitely protects the works. I've done it large scale and I've done it very small scale and I think that it's been really great on both of them. It does require a lot of work and patience and a willingness to get everything dirty, <laughs> but it's been a really amazing experience and I love the pieces that I finished off with it for the Pantones, for example, or the six foot collage I did. 
And then we can go into digital tools as well. If you're a digital collage artist, I love Photoshop. I use Adobe for that. The downside to it is, is that it does cost a lot of money and it's a monthly subscription. So that's just a downer for sure. So I think that that's everything. I'm looking around my studio. I think I've talked about everything that I have. I highly encourage you to get all of these tools and play around with them and see what works best for you. Every person's going to be different and this is just the things that I use. I know other people use like tweezers for smaller pieces, the gyro blade. I'm sure there's like hundreds of different tools for cutting and there's definitely tons of brands for glue. These are just the tools that I know and I love, but I know that there are so many out there and every couple months I always add one to my inventories. If you're watching this and I didn't mention your favorite tools, definitely comment below and let me know what they are. I know there's so many great things out there and I'm just one person, so I would love to hear what you guys are using at home. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful and let me know if you have any questions below. I will definitely see you in the next video and don't forget to like this video and subscribe.